All right, so one minute after the hour and uh, delighted to welcome you to our latest uh, Lunch and Learn session, the first one for this week. And our guest, Alan Seiden uh, from the Seiden Group who are sponsoring this session. Uh, so I'd like to thank particularly Alan because we couldn't afford to do this if we didn't have people like him willing to uh, help sponsor these things. Now I'm going to be talking about uh, consuming web services with RPG and API, H HTTP API. Uh, and we're going to do that in two parts. Uh, so basically, I am the bread. I'm told I'm a 12 grain bread. I'm not to refer to myself as a, a plain white loaf, but I am the 12 grain bread that will surround Alan's meaty sandwich. So uh, that sounds almost vulgar. My apologies if it does. Anyway, all right. So that said, I'm just going to get started here. And what we're going to talk about is what is a web service? Now, apologies to those of you who are already very familiar with that sort of topic because, but we have found in the past, we've tried to teach these sessions and so many people have just heard the term web service, but don't really know what is meant by it. So that's what we're gonna just very, very briefly address. Uh, then we're gonna talk about building the tool set, what you need to be able to have your RPG code talk to web services and particularly we'll talk about http api what it is where to find it and because i found it confuses a lot of people uh with the options that it presents how to install it it's a very very brief thing but uh, you know that's what we're going to do uh, then we're going to show you a couple of examples i'm going to start by showing you the simplest of the http apis uh which will retrieve uh, a list of colleges from a, from a, a web service. And then we'll break there for uh, Alan. And I'll look at a different way of uh, accessing the same API, one that has a little more flexibility and talk about some of the other options there. And then finally, uh, we're gonna talk about using the Watson APIs um, and how you can call those from RPG. Uh, because that uses several of the other features uh, that you're going to need to understand before you can uh, fully exploit using web services. Now, the translation API is one we're using simply because it, it's a, a very obvious, you know, you can see what happens and the, the results of using it. So that said, let's jump in. Now, basically, a web service is a vehicle by which you can call and interact with a program on another system. And the most important aspect of this is that you neither know nor care what hardware it's running on, what operating system, or what language indeed the uh, service was written in. It's completely irrelevant. So you can make a call, interact with that other program without knowing a thing about it, except how to invoke the web service. So how is the call actually made? Now, normally it's through the HTTP protocol. There are other vehicles, but that's the one we're gonna focus on. There's many, many types of web service. Now, the most popular today are REST and SOAP. Uh, SOAP stands for simple, what is it? Object access or simple something, anyway. It's not used as much as it was. It was the thing a few years ago, but now REST, because it is so much simpler, to implement uh, represents about 70% of all the web services now and growing. Uh, REST services, as I say, much simpler to implement and consume. Uh, SOAP, because it's XML based, has a very big overhead uh, to run it. And so that's partly why its uh, uh, popularity has dwindled. With REST services, the request and the response can be in any format, but the majority use JSON for the response. Uh, the Watson ones, one of the options with Watson is to use JSON in both directions, and you'll see that later. If you want a good overall explanation of REST, then check out this URL here at SitePoint, what is a REST API? It is the best, um, non-technical or at least non-technical as far as one can be explanation i have yet read 
uh, on the topic. Now, what I'm going to be focusing on is simple get requests to REST web services. I'm not doing any updates or anything like that. We'll talk a little bit about that stuff later. Now, one of the things a lot of people get confused about is how are the parameters actually being passed to the service? And basically, there are three ways in which this happens, and you can use them in combination as well. So the first way, and the one that is probably sort of in terms of get uh, requests anyway, is probably the purest rest, <clears throat> is you have a URI which has the server name. So, you know, if you were coming to my system, it would be partner400.com, then the slash, then get item identifies the service that I want. And that is going to be used in our case by Apache to route the request to the appropriate program. And then the data that you want to act on, the parameter, if you like, the primary parameter, is 12345 and that is simply in this case the item number that I want to retrieve. So get item here, yes it's a parameter but it's actually used to route the request in most cases and 12345 that's the actual data that I want to reply to. Now we can also have it in the query string part of the URL, that's the bit that follows the question mark. Now if you ever do a Google search or anything and look up in the bar, you'll see the question mark and you'll see a whole bunch of little keywords and things. So this one here, again, we identify the server. Then in this case, I'm saying get item orders. So I'm getting orders for, and I'm still specifying the item number here, but then the qualification of what data I want is there's a type and there's a customer. So what I'm basically saying is I want the full information, whatever that means, uh, for the customer AB001 whenever they have ordered product 12345. Okay, you can have multiple parameters that can be in any sequence. The type of data and the customer in this case are the actual parameters beyond the original requesting number. Now you could also have data for the request in the body. So it's text, uh, usually it's formatted, uh, often as JSON or XML. And in the example you'll see later with Watson, the request, uh, the real volume of the request is in the body of the uh, request. So we have in that particular case for the Watson ones, you'll have a base URI, and then you'll have text in the body, and you'll see how this works in a moment. So what tool do you need? Well, you need tools for testing the web services. Now, it can be as simple as just using a browser in some case, but you're very, very limited, and you can't really pass anything in the body. Uh, you can only use methods one and two from the previous chart. Much better to use one of the many free tools. Uh, the one that I'm using as my go-to tool right now is Insomnia, uh, which if you think about it, the combination of that and REST is a wonderful name. I don't know how they came up with that. That's the one I use for REST web services. Uh, I like it because it's easy to use and it's terrific for beginners. When you, I had no trouble at all jumping straight into this. I had previously used SOAP UI for uh, SOAP web services, and that worked very well. But when I started trying to use it with REST services, I found it a bit clumsy. So I looked for an alternative. I used Postman, uh, but at the time uh, I, I found it too complex for my needs. And then I came across Insomnia, and that's been my, as I say, my go-to tool ever since. Uh, we'll look at uh, Insomnia in a moment. Then you're going to need additional software in your IBM I. I'm going to be using HTTP API, more on that in just a moment. And I'll also be using Scott's Yagile library because uh, for passing JSON, that is probably the easiest way to do it. And we'll show you how that all hangs together later. So that's the basic tools that you're going to need to have your RPG talk to web services. 
Now, you can, of course, test with a browser, but I'm not expecting you necessarily to believe me on that front, but we can fuck. <laughs> Uh, I've got zoom in the way. There we go. Actually, where do we go here? There we go. So that's the results of the college list for France. If I say Ireland in honor of my friend Mr. Tui, who is not here today. Oh, right. Now you decide to go offline on me. Oh, no. Missed out the L. Can't spell. There we go. Now, you can see, obviously, you could test the web service like that, but it's a right mess. And if you wanted to actually see what the structure of the, the JSON was, then you would need to uh, put it through a filter and mess about with it. And it's just a lot of messing about. Whereas if I test exactly the same web services, web service with this time, being careful to spell it properly with insomnia, you'll see what we did was we just pasted the URL up here. And I get a preview over here that shows me all the data. And as you can see, it's much simpler to review whether you've got the data you wanted. And also, you can see the structure here, which is helpful later on when you come to build your RPG data structures to work with this. Uh, you can also, if you really want to understand what's going on behind the scenes, if you click on timeline, you can see everything that happened, all the bits and pieces, how the data was sent back to you, etc. cetera. Were there any cookies? Not this time. What were the headers used, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So it's really quite nice. You can also, from the preview, you can look at the raw data which looks as bad as in the browser, right? So do a visual preview normally, and that's much easier. So that's what insomnia looks like for testing purposes. So this same thing you've just seen, right? And once you've created one of those, you can name it and then keep it. You can group them into collections. So I've got ones for currency exchange here, for example, and so on and so forth. Now, HTTP is an open source library that was created by Scott. It's 100% RPG. If you don't like it, you can change it. Uh, it's in use daily on well over 2,000 ODNI sites around the world, uh, including ours. In fact, if you registered through our website for this seminar, it was uh, an RPG program using HTTP API that registered you with Zoom and initiated the email, etc., that you received. Uh, it provides routines for handling HTTP and HTTPS for attachments, authentication methods, whole bunch of other stuff. We also use it with Yagile uh, for JSON and XML, uh, XPAT for XML and Base64 for sometimes encoding payloads, but that's way beyond what I'm going to be doing today. A couple of quick charts on installing it. You download the save file, you upload it to your IBM I, you restore the library HTTP, libHTTP, then change your current library to that, and then create this CL program. Now, this is all in Scott's instructions that come with the download, but I'm just trying to point out that I made the mistake of noticing that it was an install program already there and tried to just run it and it is not good. It needs this, there's something in this CL program that needs to be bit compiled on your system. And I haven't explored why, just follow the instructions and everything is wonderful. Once you call install, you'll see a license screen and then this screen here. So you can choose whether you want to compile the sample programs or not. Most people do. Do you want SSL support? Now you need that if you're going to talk to any HTTPS web services, and most of them are these days. So you're gonna to want to build that support in. Now, once you do that, you'll also need to make sure that these features are installed on your system. Other than them being installed, you don't need to do anything. They just have to be there. So once you've done all that, you just press enter to continue. 
and you will then come round and be asked if you want to support if you want to install the expat support uh, now what i normally do is say no to this first one i don't want to build it from source but yes for i want to uh, compile the support in now normally i use xml into an xml sax for handling any xml payloads but I want HTTP API to be able to handle it just in case. So I build the support in this one, but not this one. And then I download the compiled version from X, of Expat from Scott's site if I ever need it, rather than build it here. But you can choose to build it as well. You just need to have the C compiler installed. All right. Come on. There we go. All right. Now, the response uh, that we get from that college service, you may have noticed that we have this sort of domain stuff. We have results which are coming in, in as going to come as an array. And we have the domain. So we have the web address for this college. And then we have the name for the college. And that's all I'm going to pick out. I'm going to ignore country because I asked for it. I'm going to ignore state province because mostly it seems to say null anyway. And I really don't care about the web pages. All I'm trying to do is just show that I can grab this data. So this is using the basic HTTP string API. It's very often all you need. The limitation is that the response can only be 100K. Now, that's often enough and this is by far and away the simplest one all we're doing here is saying i'm going to do a get using the uri which is this base here and you see it finishes up country equals and then i'm going to add the country value that's been fed in now we are going to look at all this in more detail in a moment, but once I've got the buffer back, I'm then just taking that buffer, running it into data into, and putting it into results, which is this data structure here. And that will extract all the data for me from the JSON stream, from that nasty, messy looking stream, this thing here, it'll take all of the data out of that and Put it nice and neatly into this array for you now that's we're going to come back to that after we've had a chance to listen to alan uh if you have any additional questions uh i'm happy to uh entertain them that's the word i'm looking for in the q a please remember those of you who joined late q a for questions chat just for zoom stuff and with that, Alan, would you like to take over now? Yes, absolutely. There's the my screen. You've got Thank the right you. color shirt on. I see you've got the memo. What? What kind of shirt? I have the right color shirt. This is the same as mine, <laughs> roughly. Oh, yeah. It has to be the same. I have to follow John and everything. That's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I love that topic. We like that tool too, HTTP API. You can see in the chat, people, have, there's so many different ways to do everything now. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. You got HTT, which is an HTTP API. It's an open source tool too, so that fits in with our theme. Yeah. Very clever, whoever did that at the System I Developer headquarters. <laughs> um, so we love that. We love RPG open source too. We, uh, now the um, the DB2 HTTP APIs have gotten better. Uh, you don't need Java anymore. So many ways, but this is anyway. We love that. That's our like, go-to HTTP API. Anyway, so for hello everybody, uh, we're going to cover a lot of tips here for open source or libel IBM OSS applications. So that's a hashtag you sometimes see on Twitter in different places to identify IBM open source software. Uh, my big claim to fame is that last S was me. I invented that last S at one of the common conferences. I said, you need an extra S on there. <laughs> anyway, everybody remember that historians of IBM, I remember that. Uh, so anyway, we'll go over some important tips that affect um, that, the most people how to get the best performance for ODBC, which is quickly becoming the standard way to access DB2 from 
the various um, languages, uh, web server speed, stability, uh, information about the different languages, and how to stay on top of releases. And that's one of the questions I get now is people are getting serious about some of these open source languages. And now like, oh, we have to keep these updated. And how do we do that? So we'll discuss that and then questions. Uh, so these slides, all my slides will be available in an email. Everyone who's registered will receive an email after the talk, after this session, sometime after the session today, with a link to the slide. So everybody will get that. And I tried to put a link to further information on every slide. When I didn't have time to go into detail, I show you a reference. And please, uh, you can type questions into the chat as we go. And not the chat, I'm sorry, the Q&A. <laughs> type the question into the Q&A as we go. And either Calvin might answer it or Kath will tell me that the question popped up, okay? Or we'll answer them at the end. Okay, great. So if you're anyone new to open source, uh, I wanted to provide a starting point. So I have another set of slides called Impress Your Boss with Open Source. It rhymes if you're from New, New York or New Jersey. And that that's something where we give examples of what people have done. It's kind of more inspirational, how to get started and a bit of inspirational, some ideas to show what's possible uh, on IBM I really with all the capabilities that we have. So you could just email me, alan at sitinggroup.com if you'd like those slides or, or anything else. Um, also a couple of links here on how to set up the open source environment on IBM I, which IBM has done a great job of making it easier and easier. So much simpler than it used to be. And um, then a link to our Citing Groups Community Plus uh, PHP for IBM I or CP Plus PHP. We have our own PHP that works really well um, for even very demanding workloads. Okay, let's start with some tips for uh, ODBC, which is the uh, strategic direction of IBM for connectivity from the various open source languages. Something really great they've done is uh, made the ODBC driver available using YUM and RPMs, just like all the other open source that we can get nowadays. You don't have to go in and sign all the attorney uh, checkboxes on there anymore. It's just so much easier. And we have a blog post about how to how to do that, but it basically comes down to you know, install IBM I access or it's in the ACS. There's a couple of extra little steps to initialize the repository. That's great. And we include it here under performance too, because not only do you install it, but you can update it more quickly. In fact, I believe there's an update coming in November is the next update to the ODBC driver. It's the same driver on IBM I, on Linux, Windows, and Mac. So it's really smart of IBM to be consistent like that. They're not developing a million different things. They can kind of concentrate. It works really well too. And also for our learning, we can learn once and use in many situations. There's another improvement that's coming for security. For anyone, anyone running applications on Linux that connect to IBM I, so if you're not just running your application on the I, so say Node or PHP or something, if you run on Linux, people always ask, well, how do I encrypt my connection? to the eye. Well, from Windows, there was an SSL keyword, which I'll talk more about the connection keywords. Uh, but from Linux, you had to set up an S tunnel, a secure tunnel. And we have instructions on that in the blog post linked here, but there's something new coming up in November with the next ACS ODBC driver update. And you might see like announcements from IBM that talk about the technology refreshes, TRs, containing these upgrades, but actually the ODBC and ACS stuff really is on a separate schedule. It's just a little, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, that'll be coming in November or so. And then you could actually just say SSL in your connection uh, string or setup and you automatically have um, encrypted connectivity to the IBM I. So that's great for security. That is if you're going from Linux or Mac or something. If you're on the I directly, it doesn't matter. Now, something very important about ODBC performance. This is something to tell you the truth. I ignored, I personally ignored for a long time because all these pre-start jobs, and it's the same with the old fashioned server jobs, QSQ, SRVRs. Well, the system is so good, it, it increases the number of jobs. It starts more jobs. It initializes more jobs as it's needed. And then it backs down and reduces the number of jobs, makes them inactive as you don't need them. So it pretty much accommodates peaks, valleys, and whatever requests you're making. What I didn't realize was all that starting and stopping takes a lot of uh, CPU and a lot of work on the system. And I, I, we had one system we looked at, and the system was a little bit underpowered. I have to admit, it's not wasn't like a power nine, power ten. It was a pretty old system, but still, where's the CPU usage coming from? 
And it was coming from the ODBC job starting and stopping because the default number of jobs is very low and they had peak, the, this company had very large peaks, like hundreds of jobs needed. And it would suddenly go back up, down, up, down. That itself took a lot of work in the system. So it's important if you use ODBC and really the same for other pre-start jobs is to, is to configure it for roughly peak workload or a high, higher workload. And so it's not difficult to do this. You can check out your current configuration with the command here, the display um, subsystem description, and then the subsystem. In this case, it's QSIS work, just like this. 10 pre-star job entries, type of five next to the ODBC job name, QZDA, SO init. And you'll see the initial number of jobs, only one, pretty low. Threshold one, additional number of jobs, two. It's all, the system's always going to try to bring this number down to that one, two, or three, like a small number of uh, jobs, really too small. Um, yeah, this is the, the typical number, very low defaults, but we can change it with the change pre-start job entry command, just like this, and you decide what your settings should be. Initial jobs, threshold, and additional jobs. How do we find what the right level is? It all depends on your own needs. And again, IBM gave us a nice command to use, display active pre-start job. You can run it just like this for ODBC. And there's an additional link from IBM that gives some details on it. But I have to give credit to Dawn May, performance expert, consultant at IBM I. She, she taught me a lot of this while we were working at a, um, a client together. She showed me kind of what it all meant. Anyway, um, so the pre-start jobs here, you see current number 29, average 21, peak 49. So you get an idea, oh, maybe I need to have somewhere between 30 and 50 or something. You, you decide, but... Why not start it that way instead of having the system up? Now, I didn't think the up was a problem, but the fact that it actually ends, kills them again and brings them back down and then up again, what a waste. So just set them the way you need them to be and your system will be a lot happier, perform more smoothly. Okay. So again, any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Uh, connection strings, it's very powerful. And again, it's some of the standardization. That's the power of open source and IBM's strategy. The fact that ODBC is cross-platform. It works with just about any SQL-based database, relational database, and even some non-relational databases, I think. They forced it to work that way. It's very standard. And so it works in the uh, settings of keywords and settings. And they work from the same from any language or tool. So if you learn these keywords, it works from PHP, Node.js, which is JavaScript, Python, and a lot of other tools as well, and even a command line. Just a couple of examples. Naming equals one turns on system naming mode to enable library lists. Trim char fields, which is a relatively new feature. Trim character fields to trim spaces, which you know with our fixed length characters in IBM I, it drives developers crazy. You aren't used to it. It drives them nuts. They and they eventually it's very sad when they start, you start seeing their PHP code with trim, like every field being trimmed over and over again. It's very sad to have all that wasted code. Uh, so the best thing, better thing would be to have var chars, but oh, you can just with ODBC turn uh, trim char fields equals one and the problem's taken care of. You save a lot of that wasted uh, boilerplate, boilerplate trimming code and save some bytes too. Uh, so connection strings are excellent and they can resolve a lot of issues. Um, there's a link to a blog post here on the slide. If you get the slides, you get through an email, but next slide has some examples of where connection strings can help. So these are things with our support um, support desk for the various languages. Sometimes the questions aren't they aren't about the language; they're about ODBC because people are still learning how to use it. And uh, one example is we see these errors with uh, packages like SQL packages objects. It, it's that was an optimization that by default is turned on, which saves SQL uh, reusable SQL on these uh, special objects. By default, it's turned on, but what can happen is if the SQL isn't, is not that reusable, you end up filling up those packages. And in that case, I suggest turning the extended dynamic setting to zero. By, the, by default, it is on. So I say turn uh, set that to zero is the best way to go. Maybe even for most of us as a default, unless we explicitly want to use it. So that's an example of a connection string. Uh, second one, it's not related to connection strings, but just be careful with journaling I, the IFS. Uh, be careful about journaling anything under QOpenSys. Uh, issues with like especially European characters with accents, you can set always calculate result length to one in ODBC I and I, and then after going to IBM I 7.4, you may want to set a CCSID to 1208. Anyway, just 
don't worry about this stuff. It's just letting you know that, char that uh, character, excuse me, connection strings are really powerful and they solve a lot of problems. Okay, Web, uh, any questions again? Q&A, Q&A, Q&A. Web server, <laughs> web server speed and stability. Take a look at this. So um, is Apache open source? Yes, it's an open source. The Apache HTTP server is an open source product that the Apache Foundation manages, but IBM adds its own tweaks to it to make it work better on an IBM I server and with RPG and so forth. Nginx is also a web server that works on the I and we support that, but uh, Apache already has built in IBM support. It's included with your Swama support and has integration and tools already there. So I like to use Apache unless I can't for some reason. Uh, an example is the real-time server statistics statistics that it gives you. And this screenshot shows uh, how many threads are active, how many are idle, meaning how many requests are coming in right now to this web server, how many are not. You really can learn a lot about your web traffic, your scalability, and what you need to do to configure it. Like right now, this screenshot I happened to get showed zero active threads and 40 idle threads. The system's quiet. The default number of threads is, is 40. But you can change this number. So if you see that most of your threads are being used at any given time, then you could set a setting called threads per child, threads per child. Don't worry about the wording. It's just that's the setting you set to change the number of um, connections that can come in at any one time to your Apache web server. Again, the default is 40, but on, it used to be like five. So just you should just check it. If you don't see anything, you may want to set it. And um, if you find that your web server is getting slowing down, it might be because you don't have enough, uh, your settings too low. So you can just increase that. And I have a blog post about the same thing. Again, questions, bring it into the little Q, the old Q&A. Uh, something for extra protection for your web server. This is for security and possibly performance. You may wanna set up a reverse proxy server in front of your API or your website. I mean, that one way it protects your server, your server's address for being known to anybody in the outside world. It's also an extra place where you can check for any um, like denial of service attack or too many requests coming in. It's so there's different ways to do that if you want to take that approach. One is to set up a second or an additional IBMI partition in the DMZ. If you have a skilled network networking person, they can set that up. It's just a normal IBMI partition, but it's kind of um, in the public and then your production partition is not in the public, but they can communicate very easily. You can get to your data and everything through your application. That's a nice way to go. Uh, it could be cloud-based. There's commercial ones. There's one called Cloudflare and this is not a commercial for Cloudflare. There might be other ones, but this is the one that seems to be getting popular. And that would, people would go through that to get to your IBMI. And then you could also set up a separate server in, in your network if you have the or around your network if you have the skills to administer it. So it all depends on the skills and comfort level that you may have. Uh, bots, this is a, a reason why some sites are slowing down or people say, my site froze, it's freezing, I don't know why. Well, it can be because if you actually become successful that these bots, maybe just a normal automated indexing spider like the Google spiders checking out your site to index it, that's fine. Somebody else said they, one of our clients said they uh, put up advertisements on a, on a popular social media site. And as soon as they added the, the um, advertisements, the site started to kind of make a lot of requests to check out the site that it was being advertised. And it actually used up all the connections. And um, they discovered this by looking at their web server logs, something else that Apache is good at uh, creating access logs. And they could see the same IP address over and over and over and over again. And this could be restricted by IP address if you see it repeated on your firewall, but also like the stuff like the cloud flares and maybe others have built in denial of service um, protection where it could sort of tell it's getting too many requests coming in. So that's another option there. I'm just letting you know about that. So that's, I don't know if this is exactly open source related, but it's uh, important to help keep you running well. Some more speed tips. This is, people who know me know this is one of my favorite tips. It's using the deflate. So it makes all the content that you serve smaller. It compresses it. So it is served faster, especially nowadays with websites and mobile sites that can be JavaScript heavy. 
because that's adding a lot more um, content to be served out. It's not just a simple HTML page anymore. And think of all those JavaScript frameworks that people use. In fact, using this tip helped us, one of our clients, save three to four seconds off every page, off every page load. And that was uh, people using smartphones out with poor connections, poor, the speed was not good. And it really helped them to use this technique. And by default, it is not turned on in Apache. It's not turned on or Nginx. For our um, PHP, Citus PHP, because we build a default configuration, we turn this on by default. It makes it all fast. So, but here's the settings here. You can see in that uh, courier font, <laughs> load module deflate, and then you specify what kind of content you want to compress. I found it to be totally safe. I've never, ever seen a problem with it. And I highly recommend it. You can check out the blog post for more. It just basically compresses any kind of text-based content that you send out, including JavaScript, CSS, dynamic content that your web application sends out. Um, if it's a, a RPG, RPG web content from some kind of CGI or anything else, fine, that all works too. APIs, it really helps. Uh, this compression technique also works for other things like Node.js. If you are running Node.js without, without a web server, although I recommend a web server for production, but uh, just I just wanted to find out and I could see like Node and Python are famous for all the packages and modules that are available. And there's one for compression. And you install it with NPM, install compression. NPM is the Node Package Manager, although like all these initialisms, I don't think it stands for anything anymore, but that's what it used to mean. NPM install compression. And you use it just like in the, the code I showed here, require compression. And then this is this is an express um, express framework application app use compression and it'll um, compress your content there. Although if you have a web server in front of your application, you can set up the compression there as well. Okay, like the web server is a good idea. You can set up your um, encryption SSL or TLS as we know it. All your different settings that the outside world needs to go through can be done through a web server in front of your application. Just another tip. Now, what if something's really, really slow? People, people's minds, because we're programmers, we always go to thinking, oh, it's my code, or darn, they said XYZ language was slow. I read on the internet that this language was slow, or maybe it's my SQL. I didn't properly index my table. Well, it could be any of those, but it might be a network issue. And it even could be something like DNS not being set up correctly and to find the website correctly. And uh, well, I love to use a, a tool called curl. And it's very easy to get curl. In fact, it's installed by default with the open source packages. Okay, by default, it's installed, which is fantastic. Um, so once you have curl installed, you go to a command line like call qp2 term or qsh or better yet, ssh. And I, I gave a link to a website that shows you how to do this diagnostics with curl. But you basically type curl and then some options, and then the website you want to go to, which could be your own. And then it'll tell you this. In this case, uh, it was taking five seconds exactly, just about five seconds for every load, which ra was rather suspicious to me. Mm. And it, took, it turns out it was the name lookup was five seconds. So it was really a DNS problem. We went on to uh, go config TCP, changed the DNS to like a Google DNS server or something, and then uh, the website popped up fast. So just be aware of that. But curl is great. And curl can even work inside your IBM I, like point curl to your own website and then you're actually removing network, like curl and like the internal IP address or something. And then you're eliminating all network issues. It's a great diagnostic tool if you have problems. Curl, I love curl. It's great. So, okay, that's enough about curl, but it's another open source tool that can help in many, many situations. Uh, you can, okay, this is not a talk about curl. I can go on and on about the things you can do with it, but I'll stop. Uh, Apache has some easy security improvements and whether why it's important because nowadays many many companies have um, auditors or automatic security scanners that will go around looking for any mistakes you may have made in your security and rightfully so and here's a couple of items that it may find so you don't want these issues coming up they're very easy to, to correct so one is disabling this trace and track that's a common one oh, trace and track are enabled so for trace you go into your um, web configuration. In this case, I'm showing an Apache example. If you if you want this for Nginx, just send me an email. I'll send you the Nginx version of it. Just add trace enable off to your Apache web configuration. 
restart. And then you can test it again using curl, uh, VX trace, and then the website name, and you should get uh, method not allowed if you're success if you successfully disabled it. Track should already be off by default without doing anything. And then you should be able to get not implemented if you again, if you try to ask for track. So if this shows trace and tracker off, then you can feel confident about it. Uh, one more that's very common is if you have uh, .ht access files, it's like a supplemental H, um, configuration file that gets loaded dynamically. It's like on the fly. And these are very common, especially for content management systems and frameworks and things. So what you should, but you, it, 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 uh, security scanners don't like it if the public can see the contents of these. And indeed, it may reveal information about your configuration. So all you do in your Apache config is add the lines I have here that are in gray, require all denied. And then later, if you try to access that through your browser or through curl, it should tell you uh, forbidden. And then you know you're safe. Those are just a couple of easy security improvements. So again, questions, Q&A is good. Uh, on the security uh, frame of mind here, and, the, and I should just mention again, um, we used to call our encryption, HTTP encryption, to call it, used to call it SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. The new name is TLS, which I can't remember what it stands for. It doesn't matter. But you, we'll start to say TLS more often. Because if you say SSL, that's really an older uh, protocol. TLS is the updated protocol. Even TLS has different versions, and you'll see older versions being deprecated. So we'll use both words sort of synonymously, but more and more start to call it TLS. Like even in this um, wizard that IBM provides now on the web administrator, configure TLS. So that's the proper name for it. That's a new thing that actually sets up um, the encryption e more easily. It was always pretty confusing. It's still a little confusing, but nowhere near as bad. Something else that's new, um, there's an industry trend towards shorter shorter periods of time that you can renew a certificate for, an SSL, TLS certificate. It used to be you could buy one that would last for three years or even five years, but now it's considered uh, more secure to require shorter periods of time where the certificate is valid because really each year you have to prove that you are who you are. So it's more secure for the web overall, but it means you need to renew with your vendor if you have a vendor more frequently. To make this easier, some vendors let you renew right on their website without having to request a new certificate. Because normally, if you know this gone through the process, you have to do a, a certificate um, signing request where you send this out to them every time. But there's an easier way that many vendors have now where you just say, I just renew what I have, please. If you've done that, if you just renew the certificate with the vendor directly, then IBM has a new way. And this option is not that easy to find, which is why I have the screenshot. It's called automatically renewed certificate. And you can see the checkbox. When you import a certificate from one of these vendors, you check that box, then the system will not check for a request, like a signing request. So that's something that's new too, and is in line with the new security uh, guidelines of the industry as a whole. Okay, let you take your breath for a second. So some specific tips for different languages. Uh, one is that the open source toolkits, I have a lot of confidence in them and I use them, we use them here personally. There's many different ways to call RPG programs or COBOL programs. Some prefer stored procedures, some make APIs out of the RPG programs, but uh, these the toolkits are actually pretty good. The PHP one has been around the longest and is the most mature, but Node and Python are all uh, decent and getting better. And in the back end, they all use a, an IBM program called XML service behind the scenes, which is already installed on all your machines. It lets you call RPG COBOL, pass in any kind of parameters, data structures, um, receive arrays of data structures back very efficiently. It, uh, you can do omit varying length um, var um, by val, so many different things, pretty much anything you could think of as far as parameters go. So it's, it's a nice option you uh, could consider. There's some updates to the PHP toolkit. Citing Group has been up uh, meeting weekly to make sure that the PHP toolkit and XML service get um, worked on, documented. And even uh, the Node I toolkit, we feel we feel we can pitch in and help there. So that uh, we have a link here to an, to an improvement in the documentation about the omit keyword for optional parameters in RPG. And we'll continue to do that and to collaborate with IBM 
um, the iToolkit sites. And it's just, iToolkit is just another NPM node package if you want to install that. Okay, any questions to send it all along. Just some upgrade tips, uh, like for Node.js. IBM site is very good. I like gave a link to the page here. I, I mentioned Node 16. Uh, Node 18 is available for the I, but the uh, the PM2 um, manager has a, has an issue right now. So Node 16 is probably a good one to go to. Uh, so you, you yum install Node 16, and then you could set the version of Node that gets executed globally, Node, node ver call it 16. And then once it's installed, then you can use the NPM to install various packages, various node packages like this NPM install ODBC is a very popular one we do to install node ODBC. And then you could access your database from the I or from other servers if you're authorized to do it. There's a lot, there's a lot more to this. I just wanted to give you a quick kind of uh, summary of what to do. Python is very similar. There's a nice IBM page for it. And you can often specify the versions like yum upgrade Python 3.9, and then you upgrade Python 3.9. There's different version numbers on it. And we have an article about how the default version of Python gets set as you move along with Python. And then uh, pip, <laughs> pip is a Python equivalent of NPM package manager. But um, IBM is a shortcut for ODBC, again, because ODBC is such a strategic database access method that they give you a shortcut to installing Py ODBC. It's Python's way to get to ODBC on, on the AI. Questions for the Q&A, anything? I know Calvin's answering some questions there and you may not need to tell me about them, but if there are any, Kath could tell me. Now PHP, this is where Citing Group really got its start in um, PHP and where I originally devoted my career to it. And now we've expanded to all kinds of other, all the other languages and things. But first for PHP, choose your PHP distribution. Zen has theirs, or Perforce, and then Sidon has, has ours. It, uh, the Sidon Community Plus PHP, CP PHP, is available at the link here. You can have us do an install and learn where we install with you or do it yourself. Once the repository gets set up, then it's like any other IBM I open source installation. We can do a yum install, PHP star to get all the extensions or update to get all the extensions. Very easy. Uh, people ask, what version should I be on? Uh, well, PHP 7.4 is okay, but it stops getting security fixes at the end of November 2022. So 8.0 8 or 8.1 are very good options to move toward. So do it at your own pace. Just realize that 8.0 and 8.1 are really very good. And it's pretty much time to be thinking about it, at least having a plan. And then 8.2 comes out at the end of November. And then You'll feel really bad then <laughs> when 8.2 comes out, you'll feel really bad line. So start to look at these, okay, or, or get in touch. We can help you too. Uh, so a, a tip about PHP, this is one we really that really hit home for us this year. It's an example where the defaults seem okay until you hit a certain scale and then you need to change something. So it's with PHP sessions is how kind of like if you're logged in, the PHP session will store some information about your login on the server. But we noticed um, there could be slowdowns and users randomly getting logged out, seemingly randomly being logged out. It's because the session files are being cleared or cleaned out in a certain way. The default, the default is okay, uh, but it's called session garbage collection, but it ends up cleaning things out and slowing down a user while it cleans it out, and possibly logging people out. So we found a much better way, which is pretty easy, Instead of, instead of the default where the session garbage collection gets done during the user's request, don't do it then. Instead, set, set up a scheduled job that cleans up these old session files on your own pace. Then users don't get slowed down and no one gets logged out randomly. Simple idea. In fact, if you go to the PHP session page, it kind of tells you to do this, but it should really be in the PHP instruction manual that you get, you know? So, uh, if you want details on this, I just didn't want to bog down the session with how to do everything about how to do it. Just drop me an email, though, and we have a, a PDF on how to do it. I didn't want to um, bore anyone who wasn't into PHP, but that's a definite must. Definite must for a uh, website with any kind of scale is or is to do that. Okay, and it works really well. It's easy. Just a few changes. Simple. Uh, speed profiler. PHP has something called Xdebug. Both all the distributions on the I and Zen and Sighting Group all distribute Xdebug. It's an open source extension. 
Society Group actually, we practice what we preach. We pay XDebug, the maker of it, for um, professional support to help our clients. And uh, I want to show you what it's capable of with another free tool called QCash Grind. You could actually um, see where the time goes in your application and show it graphically. Like this is showing where the, what slow queries, even with a, a Laminus uh, framework application, we saw where the time went. It turns out that the inefficient routing strategy going on. And we detected that using XDebug and QCash Grind. So all great ways. Uh, Python has a built-in profile called C profile. And um, ask me if you want details on this. I have another presentation on it. But it saves the information about whatever function you're running. And then you, again, you can view this and QCash Grind free tool, same way. You can see where your time is going through that as well. Uh, Node.js, a very popular way to run it is using um, PM2. It starts your application. You can list the app, the the servers that are running, you can end them. And we have links to the um, installation guide and another tutorial. This is a popular one and we've done a lot of work with uh, PM2. Okay, so staying current. It's a very important topic because as I say here, these open source dynamic languages change more quickly than traditional languages like RPG. RPG does get updated. But if you left it alone for a while, your application would still work pretty well. And uh, with these languages, they put frequent security fixes in and improvements. And in the case, um, I can speak for PHP, that the PHP community tries to improve the language quite regularly so that uh, they help developers make have better practices. They try to close loopholes that could cause bugs. But as a result, if you upgrade, if you wait too long to upgrade, you may have a big jump and then your, your application needs more work to keep it going. So each one has its own life cycle. And there's a great site. I saw this in um, a presentation by IBM's Mark Irish when he was doing uh, an iChime presentation. And he showed this called endoflife.date, endoflife.date. And, and these links are all on the slides that you'll get when you receive the email. But you could look up just about any language and it shows you the life cycle. And it just happened to include uh, PHP on here in the screenshot. But you could see 8.1 was released 10 months ago and it, it'll last for a couple of more years. And it's the latest version of each one. And then 8.0, you can see down at the bottom 7.3, uh, PHP version uh, done. <laughs> life has ended, <laughs> no more updates. 7.4 still has a bit more to go as far as security fixes. 8.0 is good in the green zone. And then 8.1 is really, really in the green zone. That gives you an idea at a glance. And the same for Node, Python, everything else in the world of open source. So how do you do this? It's important to have a plan. And the first time you do it, you get into a rhythm. So I know it's not something we're used to doing, but once you get into it, you say, okay, once a year, we're gonna do an upgrade. Uh, ideally have some automated tests, it would be nice, but just have a plan and just get into a rhythm about it. Uh, you also need some area where you can test your new versions, even if it's a CH root or a true root, have a development area or a partition or a CH root to, to test in. Uh, try maybe quarterly to do a minor update, small update to keep it easy and set aside some time to upgrade and test. Uh, the best way, like I find for me, we're also busy. I like structure. I like structure with my team to help, help stay organized and make sure things get done. It's better than telling someone do this when you get time because no one ever has time. We're also busy meeting requests from the business. And because this is like a more indirect business benefit, we need to schedule it. So I would say schedule regular environment reviews with your team. What versions do we have? take a look at the logs. And so um, maybe this is a bit of a, a commercial note, but we do this for a reason in our own support, support service. We don't just wait for a phone call with some problem. We do proactive, we schedule proactive tune-up reviews. Again, it's like creating a structure that makes everything a very relaxed and easy process. So we get on the phone and we do a Zoom call and we look and say, okay, what versions do you have? Ah, well, this is okay, but this one you should consider upgrading X, Y, Z time, kind of plan it, help them plan it. Look at the logs and do some hands-on update help also. And so we're, we're just there to support what a good process is. And because we've had a lot of experience, we can give some tips along the way. You can do this in-house as well. And then uh, 
to keep developers updated, we have our developer support, developer productivity support, which means developers can just ask us questions without incurring an extra cost. It's kind of built into that developer support. And that's a way of their own knowledge going. Because we talk about modernization, it's partly technology and it's partly a lot of it's people, right? It's all about the people. Okay, so uh, one caution that one of our clients found, they used yum to remove Python. They thought, I don't, I don't need Python. But what happened, it also removed their PHP and they removed their node <laughs> because they both relied on Python since Python is such a, a common language for yum and RPNs itself. So we had made a blog post about this. Be careful when using yum remove. Uh, make sure you know what packages rely on it first before you remove something. And don't remove Python. You, you need it, whether you use it for programming or not. So just watch out for that one. Uh, so just a, a note here about uh, citing groups PHP. Of course, we support Node. That's my timer saying I'm right on time here. Uh, IBM's uh, distribution of Node and Python and things like that. But then we have our own community plus PHP. Never licensed, but we have optional paid support. It's compatible with all the frameworks. A lot of the vendors, the ISVs, whether it's um, Fresh Web Smart, uh, Curbstone, Harris Data, many um, ISVs rely. I mean, they use they'll they'll work with all the different PHPs out there, but they've verified that ours works well. That's what they've that's the right wording for it. And if you ever want to think about an upgrade, we do a free migration assessment. It's not a sales pitch. Just go over it with you, look at it with you, see what your options are, whether it's a PHP upgrade, Node upgrade, or a Python upgrade. And then we have our professional support options up to 24-7. And again, we're very developer-oriented. We like people to be self-sufficient, so we'll, all, we'll share our knowledge, just like um, John here sharing his knowledge about HTTP API. So um, we have a couple of minutes. If there's any questions, I guess I can look at the Q&A myself or Kath can direct me to anything, any questions that we want to look at. I'm just going to leave the slide up here. Kath or Calvin, is there anything worth mentioning about questions that popped in? Maybe Calvin I would answered. say the only um, major question here is about WBC pre-start -job, pre jobs and how they interact with locking. With locking? Yes. Oh, OK. Um, is there a specific question? Uh, yes, from Greg. Can you tell me? Um, that was, that was oh, here it is. Of it. Oh, I see. Do ODBC pre-start jobs affect object table record locking? I I don't know. We have that issue with this with the package locking that you want to probably turn off. Turn off the package locking. I don't really think so. It's the only thing is that that job stays there. So it's like as if you had an interactive session where someone was using something. So if the and with the job being active, do locks get released? That's a good question. It really depends. Like, there's different kinds of locks. There could be an exclusive lock. Like, say you had an RPG program that did an exclusive lock. That's one thing. That wouldn't necessarily get released unless you do it in your program the way you need to. However, there's also something called um, uh, it's like a read a read lock, a shared read lock. If we use, like, for instance, the PHP persistent connections. Shared read locks uh, stay open on purpose. So if you keep your ODBC job active, normally in something like an ODBC job, even if it's pre-start, will kind of go into a somewhat quiet state after you use it, even though it's ready to use. It kind of goes into a quiet state. But if you do a persistent connection or potentially a connection pool, you, your application is keeping it active and keeping locks on things on purpose. So. I guess there's different kinds of locks. I don't know if I really helped you, <laughs> but there's shared read locks that normally get released pretty easily, unless you're doing a persistent type of connection. And like a, an exclusive type of lock, you really want to take care of in your program because otherwise it, it will stay there. But just like just like any job that stays active running. So I don't know if that, if that helped, but if you have a specific question, you know, drop me a note later. Oh, how do you access the, I see from John, how do you access the Apache statistics? Was that answered already? Yeah, the Apache statistics. Uh, there's a link in um, there's a link in the slides about how to get the Apache statistics, the real time server statistics, so you can get to it that way from the administrative console. Okay, so uh, so Greg can drop me a note if he has a specific question about the locking. Anything else that wasn't answered? 
Everything's answered, right? Okay. Those okay, two great. questions should be. Those yeah. two questions. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. So anything else? Or should we should we bring it back to John for HTTP API? Okay, great. So thanks everybody. Get in touch if you uh, you again you will receive these slides through your email and get in touch if you have any questions or need help with anything. And I think why don't I stop sharing? We can bring it back to John, Mr. Bread, Mr. 12 grain bread. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. There's a couple of bits in there, interestingly enough, that uh, I need. So uh, Susan just reminded me. So I'm going to have to get back and look at some of that later. All right. Um, so let's uh, carry on where we left off. And uh, then we'll have time for some more Q&A at the end of the session with any luck. Uh, we don't have a hard stop on here. So let's, uh, let's look at that college's web service thing uh, that I mentioned. Um, you can basically see that when I talked about the types of parameters that uh, and how parameters are sent, we've got the basic URI here, we've got search, which is part of it, and in that case, this is obviously dictating the uh, API, it's identifying the API, and then they have chosen to make the parameter come in as part of the query string, country equals, and then I actually add it uh, down here into the uh, <coughs> excuse me into the request. So what's actually happening here is that uh, we're using HTTP string. You can do any kind of request you like, uh, and it will return the result as a string here. The only thing you have to watch out for is that because it's returning the results as a string you don't get a status code back or anything to tell you when something went wrong. Uh, and so what you normally want to do, although it's not in this particular sample program, is to include it in a monitor group so that if there's an exception, you can trap it and interrogate uh, the HTTP API underpinnings to see what the actual error was. So that's basically uh, you know, how that works. Um, so we're doing a get and we're passing the, the complete query string here and that will just do the operation and uh, pass us back the buffer. Now, if I actually pull up my 5250, this is where I go live and everything goes wrong. Yep, we're off to a good start. <laughs> And it's decided to lose my 5250 for me. Well, this is no fun at all. And one of the things that I thoroughly dislike about client access, uh, access client services is that the silly thing will not. Okay. All right, I'll just start again. Excuse me, this is gonna, it's just gonna take a second because I have to change my library list a bit. Oh, of course, now, now that I've found it, Okay, get college one. That's the first one. So it's just asking me for a country. I'm in Canada, so I'm going to ask for Canada. It says it's found 304 colleges, and the first three are, I can't even pronounce that first one. It's a Quebec one, Lampton, which happens to be one of the schools that teaches IBMI, interestingly. We've dealt with them before, and there's the URL, and Acadia University. Etc., and then that's the end, right? So that's the basic version. This thing here is actually calling that result, it is using data into here to pass the JSON out into this structure. Now, as domains and name we talked about before, and you can see you, you saw that those were a part of the JSON result. I've said I want up to up 9,999, <clears throat> excuse me. These days I usually use uh, automatic extending data structures, but this is uh, part of an older example. Um, and then data into results. So into this data structure, using the buffer that we retrieved from calling HTTP string. 
count prefix equals num. That is because the domains is an array. And if there are more than one domain, I need to be able to check how many there are. And up at the top level here, I can use a value in the PSDS that will tell me how many elements there are at this level. But when it's nested arrays, I can't do that. So this count prefix basically allows me to specify that I've got 10 array elements here, but RPG will maintain a count here with domains, domains, num, num. It will allow me to keep those going. Uh, then we also say allow extra, and that's because there's all those unwanted elements in the JSON that we just want to ignore. We don't want to worry about them at all. The parser, I'm using Yagil into, which is something that Scott provides as part of his Yagil library. And uh, that does a very good job of uh, acting as the parser on the JSON data. Uh, some of you may have noticed that with data into, IBM shipped a JSON parser code with it, but it's not suitable for production use. So don't make that mistake. Uh, much better to use Scott's implementation. Now, for cases where we've got a much bigger result that we want to handle, we've got HTTP request. Much more powerful option. Again, it can do any kind of request, get, post, put, etc. We specify the type we want to do, the URL the same as before. And then we have pairs, result stream file, result string, send stream file, send string. These are pairs, and whichever one of the pair you're not using, you specify the other one as omit. So I am going to receive, I want to receive the results as a string. So I am going to say omit the value for result stream file and specify buffer the name of my field to receive the text. Okay, so I can similarly, if I have data to send on a put or a post operation, I can do the same thing. I can either send it from a file or I can send it as a string. So you'd use a file, for example, if you have a PDF file somewhere on your system that you're uploading to another site, or if, you, if you've got a, a string that you're updating some data content, you use that one. Uh, the content type is just used to override the defaults uh, when you want to specify the type of data that you're sending. And it's a little bit beyond the scope of this session to go much further than that. So that's basically the exact same example you just saw, but using HTTP request the rest of the code is fundamentally the same. The big difference is that if I access client services, I hate you. Tim, you're going to get a rude letter about this. I'm having to keep starting new ones to force it to show me the session. So if I do a call on that original example, it's asking me for country again. If I say United States, it'll blow up. And that's because there is so much data coming back that it has blown the end of my buffer and it is not valid, therefore valid JSON. If on the other hand, I use the second version, which is the one that uses, whoops, the new one, it will take a little while because it found 4,300. And the first three, Marywood, Lindwood, and Solomon, right? So the second one, because it is using HTTP request, is able to handle the bigger payload, okay? All right, now, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to show the Watson Tran example first, uh, because I'm having such trouble getting back to my 5250 sessions. So I'm going to call this and show you this next example now quickly. It's asking me what I want to translate. And 
hopefully that's going to work. That translates to aujourd'hui et mon anniversaire de mariage, mariage, I suppose. Anyway, right, so that was Watson translating for me. Total of six words and 32 characters in the response. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But since I was on the 50 to 50, I didn't want to lose it again. I hope you'll excuse that. So this is how we use the Watson translation API. And we have something slightly different to do here because we need to build the request. Now I'm going to flip into insomnia here and show you a test of insomnia. Uh, because it's a little bit easier to explain this way, because you can see the bits. So up at the top here, you see the URL. It's a big basic URL, right? Then we have the basic information. This is basic authentication. So I have to sign in with a username and a password. Okay. So I have to sign in with those. Those are part of the header authentication and we'll see how we set that in a moment. Then in addition to that, I have to have in the body. So this one is a combination, what I said to you before about the different methods of passing data. This is a combination of number one, the URL itself, plus the body, number three. So I've got here the we have to specify text and the model ID is how we tell it what language is to translate from and to. So I'm going from English to French. So this is the text I want translated. I send that and the Watson one is not that is much faster the second time around, but uh, and I get the translation back and you can see where the word count and character count came from. Um, so if I ch were to change this to test for a different language, I think that's right for Spanish. Yeah. So we now got Spanish instead. All right. But you can see this is the body of the request. This is the authentication data. And this is the base URL. Now let's look at how we do that in RPG. We've got request here. And it's got text and model ID. So again, text, model ID. But rather than form that string by hand, what I'm doing is I'm using data gen to generate that text using the agile data gen from my request data structure. So the request data structure has text and model ID, and it uses these names, text, model ID, oops, come back, text and model ID in the generated JSON that it will put in here. So this is a test of Watson Translate, that was where I keyed in, model ID, English, French, Model ID initialized to English French book. So it takes the name of the element from here, puts it in quotes. It takes the data from the element and puts it in quotes in here with the colon, et cetera, made valid JSON. So that is being generated by data gen. Then the next thing we do is to set option. And we're telling the network, that is to say the communication channel, that we want to use UTF-8, that's CSIG 12, 1208. Um, by default, it would use ASCII. So we need to tell it we want to use UTF-8 because it's sending JSON. And then we're going to do a set authority. So this is a special routine in HTTP API that lets us set up the authority. And we tell it we want basic authentication with user and password. And it knows how to format that to put it correctly into the header that it sends along with the web request. So set option, 
tells it to use the 1208 for the network authority. This is how you set the authentication. Um, I used for when you registered for the session with Zoom with uh, our website, the Zoom HTTP API was called to interface to Zoom. And at the moment, they use JWT, uh, JSON, uh, JavaScript web tokens, or whatever the heck they are. Uh, and they use JWT for authentication. So I build the JWT, but I use set authority to actually put it into the header. Uh, HTTP string is the method that we saw just now to actually make the, the request. And what we're doing in this particular case is we're saying HTTP string again, post this time because we're sending it data, URI as before, and then the request JSON, the stuff that we built just now with this. So this thing here is what we're sending it. All right, so once we've done that, what we're going to get back in the result is this. We're going to get start of an object, translations, and then an array of a translation. And if there were multiple translations, they would be here. And then word count and character count, which we've matched up here to this number of translations, data structure. I've said only dim one, but I don't care. There's only ever, on my test, there's only ever going to be one translation. The translation, but I have to tell it it's a, an array, by the way, because this is an array and RPG would get upset because it wouldn't be able to find the match. The translation and the data structure, the word count, the character count coming from here and here. Data into will take that result that we produced and it will put it, pass it out into this translated data using Yagile into. Now there's one other option I've taken for Yagile into here, which is to say that the document name is translated data because I need the parser to say, I've got translated data because that is my top level name, right? So that will pump out this name RPG will get hold of that and say, oh, he means this thing. And then within that, we've got translations and word count and character count, et cetera. Okay. So that's how that hangs together. <clears throat> now, if you, you know, this is obviously a very short thing. Uh, I've written more on the subject uh, that you can find. We've got this uh, authory website. Um, Hopefully that's going to work. Yeah. So this is just the uh, the articles related to this. It talks about data into and data gen with web services, um, and there's uh, some other bits and pieces in here in that particular collection. But there's also uh, while you're at there the website. There's also several hundred other articles in there as well. If you've got some time you want to spend. Um, there's also a collection, if you're interested in JSON processing, where I go into a lot more detail about JSON processing. There's some overlap between this collection and this one, but uh, if, you, if you're just interested in the JSON stuff, that's here, and it includes using the raw uh, JSON APIs, the Agile APIs to generate and consume JSON. Um, Scott has done a number of presentations on his own subjects, and you'll find them here on his website. And also, if you want support for HTTP API and other stuff from Scott, then he's got a forum you can see here, HTTP API, which has got quite a few Q and A's. Um, this is fairly recent. Uh, this is about 12 months old, I think, just a bit more than 12 months. But uh, this is one place you can go and get questions answered. And folks like myself, and of course, Scott, uh, will try and help you out. So uh, let me come back to this again. And if you have any questions uh, that you think of after this session, then you can email me anytime. That's my email address there. And with that, uh, we're going to we just about at the end of our time. But uh, if anyone has any additional questions, then uh, 
Okay, there's one here from Paul about using auto arrays. Uh, the answer to that is yes, Paul. Uh, but uh, and I do normally use auto arrays both for all my SQL stuff and also for this kind of thing. Um, but when teaching a specific topic like this, I like not to have too much stuff that people may not be familiar with. And a lot of people uh, will look at an auto array and spend the rest next five minutes wondering what that was. And of course, if you're not on 7.4 or later, you can't use them anyway yet. So that, that's basically the, uh, the answer to that one. Um, the rest of it uh, seem to be thank yous and similars. Uh, there's a bunch of address questions. Were there any there, Susan, I need to worry about? I don't think so. No. Okay. In that case, um, I, I will answer myself the, the one question that, that invariably comes up when we do this, um, which is, why do I use HTTP API? And the answer to that question is, I don't just use HTTP API. Um, there is also the, the IWS tooling from IBM. And I'll, I will be brutally honest about that. that I don't like it. Uh, I like IWS as a means of providing web services um, as a, a, a good starting point to basically turn a simple RPG program into a web service. Uh, but I do not like uh, their equivalent of HTTP API. And part of it is that it comes across to me as being a set of C functions that somebody who didn't know RPG very well wrapped up in RPG to make it easier for RPGs to use it. But if you look at the way HTTP API is designed and compare it with that, it is very obvious that, that HTTP API was done by somebody who was familiar with RPG, likes RPG, um, and it just feels better for want of a better description. Now, the other obviously elephant in the room is SQL. Uh, first of all, I should be honest and say when I first started using SQL for processing web services, uh, it used Java as the underpinnings and it was horribly slow. Uh, I did not like the syntax. I still don't like the syntax. I think it sucks to be perfectly honest. But then a lot of SQL syntax is like that. Um, it, it's, you know, if, if you're familiar with RPG, you ignore the warts. If you're ultimately intimately familiar with SQL, you also ignore the warts, I think. Uh, I just find that the, the problem for me with SQL uh, handling uh, web queries is it does a good job on the simple stuff and it gets exponentially more complicated as the uh, web service uh, you're dealing with gets more and more complex. And particularly when you've got additional authentication methods and new stuff that you need uh, with HTTP API, you can basically roll your own and still use it uh, with the, uh, the services provided by IBM, you can't. So if you are very, very familiar with SQL, by all means, go ahead. Just use the, all I'm saying is use the right tool for the job, okay? If, uh, if you happen, your thinking happens to map to IBM's IWS stuff, use it, you know? Uh, there's also a lot of third-party tools out there that can do this stuff, but you're gonna have to obviously pay for those, whereas uh, we're talking here about free, free software and or software provided already with your system. Okay, well, with that, if there aren't any more questions, and I don't see any having come in, I would like to thank you all for joining us. I would like to, oh dear, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Susan's familiar with that. She gets terrified by my sneezes. Uh, so the, uh, I'd like to thank Alan and the Sidon Group for sponsoring the session today. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. I hope that uh, you will join us for future sessions. If you uh, want 
or if you missed some of this, uh, you can go back to uh, the web page where you registered and you can watch the recording at any time. Uh, it'll be there for just over a month. And uh, with that, I will close this up and say thank you all for joining us. And thanks again, Alan, for sponsoring this session. Great information. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.